Well, um, let's start with Peru. It's a good place to start. Um, um, for one thing, as Michelle mentioned, that's a country that I worked on for quite a long time, but it was also the birthplace of illicit cocaine. And let me try to explain this in a very uh, succinct way. The eastern Amazonian region of Peru, particularly the what's called the Montaña, some of you have probably heard of this, the eyebrow of the jungle where the Amazon uh, meets the foothills of the Andes, um, uh, is a place that has a very, very long historical relationship, not only with coca leaf, um, but also with cocaine. Um, the area around Huanuco, or um, you probably have heard of the Huayaga region, the Huayaga Valley region of Peru, um, had long historical ties to what was um, uh, a perfectly legal and respectable national cocaine industry in Peru, which dated to the 1880s. And what we're talking about here is the medical commodity um, cocaine. It was used mainly for local anesthesia. It was derived from local coca leaf. And in the late 19th century and early 20th century, it was marketed globally by um, sophisticated firms like uh, German, uh, the German Merck um, company. Um, and in fact, um, it's worth noting that Peru's turn of the century cocaine industrialists had invented and specialized in the export of something that they called crude cocaine, or cocaina bruta, which was a valuable semi-refined sulfate of coca paste um, that Merck and other uh, companies um, then refined into medical grade cocaine hydrochloride, or the kind of white stuff that some of you may be familiar from with from, uh, say, the movies. Um, not coincidentally, this is the same jungle mix um, that is today um, and has been known since the 1960s as pasta básica de cocaína, or, or PVC, um, which is the chief peasant ingredient um, in today's global cocaine trade. Anyway, after World War II, this cradle <laughs> of legal modern cocaine in the Andes rapidly transformed into its opposite, an underground source of illicit cocaine. In 1947, the first clues appear in a trickle of sailors um, who were using Graceline ships up the um, coast of South America all the way to New York to smuggle in small stashes of cocaine. And they were really talking about um, ounces of cocaine that they would hide in their luggage or their pockets or something like that. And the likely root of this was the final shrinkage of the prior but long declining pharmaceutical markets like uh, Germany's for cocaine and um, after World War II the tightening restrictions on cocaine by uh, a kind of new collaboration between um, U.S. and Peruvian officials. In 1948, U.S. drug agents began their first ever overseas anti-cocaine <coughs> investigations and sting operations, um, which reached all the way from um, New York um, to that swath of the Eastern Andes that I was just uh, referring to. And in August of 1949, very dramatically, there's the first international cocaine scandal, or scare, which erupts. Um, um, around the so-called Barareso gang. And you can see I've included here some mug shots of the early, some of the most notorious early cocaine traffickers that uh, I've discovered. Uh, and this is um, he, Eduardo um, Barareso. Um, he was a very enterprising Peruvian sailor. Um, and the arrest that happens in 1949 um, results in more than a hundred actually arrested, uh, ranging all the way from East Harlem, where a lot of the uh, drug was distributed, um, kind of revealing um, consumer spot, um, all the way down to the Wayaga Valley. And this was the first modern cocaine bust. It sparked a flurry of international uh, press in, May, in 1949, uh, May, 
um, Time magazine uh, dubbed cocaine in this little article Pichicata, Peru's White Goddess. Um, you know, kind of a little sensationalistic piece, but very revealing of the type of gendered and racial connotations that cocaine was going to have um, over the years. So from 1949 to 1950, um, we see a very intense wave of repressive measures and missions, which ranged all the way from the new UN, was very anti-drug, um, to Peru's own military establishment to wipe out this little outbreak of illicit Andean cocaine. And effectively, what this did was end the older legal industry, um, indeed criminalizing and jailing uh, most of its former leaders. But if this crackdown temporarily displaced cocaine from its eastern Peruvian birthplace, these pressures also sparked a rapid dispersion of the techniques and knowledge about cocaine, particularly to neighboring Bolivia, a country which um, historically had never experienced the so-called industrialization of coca. Um, the, that's a term that's actually sometimes even used <coughs> today, a kind of a politically correct term to refer to the making of cocaine. Um, and so what we're seeing here at the very beginning of the crackdown on cocaine in the 1940s is an example of what drug specialists always call the ballooning effect. You, um, you know, clamp down on one place and it spreads out to uh, a, another set of more elusive sites. Um, and I even found a very colorful document, uh, very detailed, of the FBN. The FBN, the Federal Bureau of Narcotics, was the um, uh, 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 mid-century mid uh, precursor to the DEA, which claimed that Andres Soberon, who was Peru's uh, most respected and long-standing patriarch of legal cocaine, became a kind of uh, Johnny Coca Seed of illicit of drugs, that he had sent his uh, underlings and his technicians to Bolivia in the early 1950s to seed this new cottage industry there. Um, so, um, and the Soberon name, even today, there's the Soberon, one of the Soberon's grandchildren in Peru, as you probably know, um, Ricardo Soberon is a, is a, is a expert on drug law and drug, and, but that was his grandfather who was the, um, one who was allegedly involved in the creation of the, I don't think it's actually true, um, but that his grandfather had been the last legal um, producer of cocaine. Those of you who know Peru, or even this guy, Ricardo. Uh, he's still very intensely interested in the issue. Um, so during the 1950s, you see this novel, now fully illicit drug, cocaine, but it gravitates from Peru very quickly, um, despite occasionally um, the visits by Cuban uh, mafiosos to Lima looking for <coughs> cocaine to sell, occasionally popping up of a lab in the remote parts of Amazonia, and nor had this kind of early Peruvian cocaine sent out any social roots. Um, it, was, it was opportunistic in a certain way. Uh, it had not brought into play its own dynamics. For example, there was no coca-growing peasantry explicitly dedicated to cocaine. Instead, it lived off um, traditional um, Indian coca marts or, or cultures. 